Uh, welcome, welcome, welcome. My name is Dwayne Quasey Wright. I am an assistant professor of higher education administration, as well as a director of diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, for the Graduate School of Education and Human Development here at GW. For those that may not have the ability to see me, I am an African-American male. I have dreads, even though it's kind of hard to see in this box right here. Uh, breaking all types of fashion rules, I have a striped shirt and a polka dotted tie and what would look like a black sweater, but it really is dark blue. And I have the distinct pleasure and honor of welcoming you to the 2024 uh, MLK lecture here at GSHED. Uh, on behalf of our Dean, Michael Foyer, our uh, Senior Associate Academic Dean, Lionel Howard, our uh, faculty, our staff, and most importantly, our wonderful students, I wanna give a welcome to you uh, to this event. A brief history of this event, our previous director of our Multicultural Student Center, Carlos Wiley, invited me to give a lecture uh, during King Week in January of 2020, right before COVID. And in doing that, I saw the intimate connection uh, between King's dream for a beloved community and education. Uh, when I became director of diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives here later that year, the MLK lecture was one of the premier things that I thought was necessary, and I just started, decided to happen. Um, it showcases a junior faculty who we determine whose research agenda follows in the legacy of Dr. King. We started in 2021 with Dr. Sarah Ray. We then advanced to Dr. Denise Dorch in 2022. Last year, we were blessed to have our first outside GW MLK lecturer in Dr. Carmine Carner from Roosevelt University of Chicago. And this year in 2024, we are definitely blessed to get a word from our Department of Special Education and Disability Studies. Uh, please, throughout today's lecture, feel free to engage in the chat function. I see many of you, welcome, have been introducing yourselves. If you have any questions, comments, concerns, want to share information, we are here to learn, and the chat function is an appropriate place for that. And as I said before, if you are a little shy, a direct message to myself or Meg Holland, uh, we will be sure to rephrase or reframe your question, comment, or concern uh, for the speakers. So what are we here to talk about today? I think today's uh, presentation falls really appropriately at the intersection of two identities, identities that may not necessarily jump out to you as oppressed identities, but definitely have been constructed as such uh, in recent times, if not long before that. The first identity is that of a teacher, and we are blessed and thank you for any teachers K through 12 or any level, quite frankly, that are joining us here today. And we know that over the last three years, our teachers have had a hard time here in America over the last three years, over the last three decades. Uh, you understand, teachers have been uh, discriminated, underpaid, disgruntled, and disrespected. They've been asked to take on more and more in the classroom in addition to their teaching duties. In fact, to flip the old biblical line from Luke, our teachers have been asked and required to do much where little has been given to them. The other identity is that of those that may live uh, with disabilities. And many of you that know me well know one of my favorite quotes from MLK is that the riot is the language of the unheard. And we focus a lot on the riot part of that quote, and rightfully so. We have a lot of riots right now in America, a lot of riots around the world. And as an election year, there'll be riots to come. But I wanna focus very briefly now on the unheard portion of that. And simply walking to my office to give this intro to the event today, I exercised an immense amount of able body privilege. I was able to go up and down stairs to get to my office. I was able to hear once we came on. I was able to speak and actually use my voice. Um, I have no necessarily um, neurodivergence, uh, so I am not bothered by speaking here. And the plight of those that live with disabilities have been unheard. So ubiquitous is able-bodied privilege that the ableism that comes for it is often ignored, erasing those with disabilities or disabled people, to use the language of our presenter, 
from the civil rights discussion altogether. And if we think about the intersection of those two identities, uh, this, those that live with disabilities and those that are also teaching, um, the stories that come from the bottom of the well, the stories that come from that intersection um, need to be lifted up. If for anything, those that don't have a voice to lift up every voice and sing, we have to find a way for their stories to come through. Because without true equity, there is no empathy. And without empathy, the system that creates oppression uh, cannot actually be defeated. I will leave you before I turn it over to our speaker with an MLK quote. And the quote that I want you to think about throughout this presentation is that true compassion is more than flinging a coin to the beggar. It comes to see that the edifice which produces beggars needs reconstructing. And I think that as you listen to the stories of our disabled teachers here today, it calls for that edifice to be restructured, broken down, and I'm so happy that we have someone here today that can lift that voice up so everyone can sing. The way this actually works is we have a presentation and then a response. Uh, the presentation will be from Dr. Elizabeth Kusher and the response will be from Dr. Elizabeth Rice. I will give an introduction to both. At the end of the response, we will have a structured Q&A, but as I said before, please feel free to put your questions in the chat. If you've got to leave right at that one hour, we might not get to the questions right at that time, and then I will make sure that our speakers are there for you. And now, without further ado, let me introduce the 2024 MLK lecture, Dr. Elizabeth Kutcher. Dr. Elizabeth Kutcher is an assistant professor of special education and disability studies here at the Graduate School for Education and Human Development. Dr. Kutcher's research focuses on cultivating inclusive educational spaces that recognize disability as a dimension of human diversity using a critical disability studies lens. She values the application of qualitative and mixed method approaches to understand and multifaceted educational experiences. Dr. Kusher is currently co-leading a study funded by the Johnson Scholarship Foundation to understand how colleagues prepare uh, with disabilities for employment. Other outstanding projects include uh, an investigation of how teachers with disabilities contribute to a diverse workforce and collaborations with researchers in my home country of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago to understand the experiences related to education and, and disability. She is an active within the Council of Exceptional Children Division on the Career Development and Transition and the Mixed Method International Research Association. Prior to moving to the DC area, Dr. Kusher was a special education teacher and assistant principal in not necessarily my city of origin, but my home city of New York City. Um, friends, can you please welcome my friend, the 2024 GSHET MLK lecturer, Dr. Elizabeth Kusher. Thank you for joining us. Oh my goodness, thank you so much for that amazing introduction, um, Dr. Wright. I'm just going to share my screen with all of you. All right, so hopefully everyone can now share see my screen. Um, if you can't, give me a wave and I'll troubleshoot. Um, but I'm, I'm very honored today to um, get to be a part of this lecture series. series. Um, I had the pleasure in the past of getting to listen to um, past MLK lecture series, and so I know I have some very big shoes to fill that I can't possibly fill, um, but I hope that the, the ideas I share um, today will generate some thought, um, and I very much look forward to Dr. Rice's comments at the end of the lecture. So um, as Dr. Wright mentioned, my name is Elizabeth Kutcher, um, and I'm a white woman with uh, shoulder length blonde hair, wearing glasses, and a black and white printed blouse. Um, and I'm very honored that all of you have taken time out of your very busy schedules to, to join this today. And I look forward to any of your feedback or comments at the end. So this talk today is focused on a different dimension of diversity than might first come to mind when we think about Dr. King. Um, specifically today, I want to share some findings that have come out of a project focused on the stories of disabled teachers. Um, and I want to make sure as I get started that I recognize that this is definitely not my project, but something that I've been working on with a team. Um, and that team includes Dr. Matthew Flan Flanagan, Dr. Chloe Massey, and Dr. Jennifer Lillis. And I'll share a little bit more about our research team as we get into the methods of this study. 
So just to give you an overview of my plan for today, um, I want to share a little bit about the history and context for this work. I'll provide some information about the study design. I'll share some selections from our findings and some interpretation. And then I'm looking forward to being joined by Dr. Rice for comments. But before we dive in, I do want to pause for a moment to talk about the language we use when we're talking about disability. There are two um, generally accepted approaches for talking about disability. One approach is called person first or people first language. Um, and with this approach, we identify the person first, as you might have guessed from the title, um, and then we describe the disability. So for example, we might say teachers with disabilities or an educator with autism. And this language approach is commonly recommended, um, especially in the field of special education, because it's considered to emphasize the person rather than their disability. The other approach is identity first language. And with this approach, disability is considered part of the person's identity. So for example, we might say disabled teachers or an autistic educator. And this language um, or this approach is preferred by some members of the disability community because they feel that disability is a critical part of their identity. So for example, I wouldn't refer to myself as a teacher with femaleness. I'm a female teacher. And so identity first language recognizes that central role of disability in a person's identity, um, if applicable. So throughout this presentation, you're going to hear me switching back and forth between person first and, identi and identity first language, um, especially depending on the preference of participants. So with that in mind, I want to provide some history and context. Um, what do we know about teachers with disabilities? Um, and since this is the Martin Luther King Jr. lecture, I want to share a little bit more about how the disability rights movement is really intertwined with the larger civil rights movement. And because my background is in education, my timeline starts with Brown versus the Board of Education, which um, we all know is the Supreme Court decision that this concept of separate but equal education um, is inherently unequal. And I'm starting with Brown versus the Board of Education because the two court cases on this timeline following Brown, specifically Pennsylvania Arc versus the Commonwealth in 1971 and Mills versus the Board of Education of the District of Columbia in 1972, drew specifically from Brown when arguing for the educational rights of students with disabilities. Um, in 1974, Public Law 94-142 was passed which protected the rights of children with disabilities to a free and appropriate public education in the least restrictive environment. And some of you may be more familiar with Public Law 94-142 as the Individuals with Disabilities Education Improvement Act of 2004, or it's also known as IDEA. So nestled in between the court cases on this timeline and Public Law 94-142 um, is the passage of Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act in 1973, which prohibited employers and organizations that receive federal funding from discriminating against people with disabilities. And though that act was passed in 1973, it took four years and a massive protest from the disability community for regulations to be issued. Um, and that protest drew on many of the lessons learned from the civil rights movement. All that said, it wasn't until 1990 that the civil rights of people with disabilities were protected by the Americans with Disabilities Act. And on this slide, there is a photograph of activists celebrating in 1993, the passage of and implementation of the Americans with Disabilities Act. And activists are holding up a banner quoting Dr. King, which says, injustice everywhere is a threat to justice. Sorry, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. So you might be wondering if um, teachers with disabilities fit into this historical context, and they do. Um, some of you might be familiar with Judy Human. Her book, Being Human, was our G-Shed book, um, book club of the semester this fall. And she was considered by many to be the mother of the disability rights movement. Um, she played also a critical role in the 504 protests that I mentioned on the previous slide. She sadly passed away not quite a year ago, um, but as a young college graduate in 1970, she literally made headlines. And on this slide is a clipping from the New York Times showing a young Judy Human with her lawyer um, when she sued the New York City Board of Education for denying her a teaching license due to her physical disability. And I, I would love to be able to tell all of you that things have changed since then. 
But um, one of our participants in our study was also told by her university advisor, um, she used the word adamantly, she was adamantly told that she could not be a teacher because she uses a wheelchair. Um, and the quote in the title of this presentation, There's Power in Representation, comes from that participant who was even more determined and convinced of the need to enter the teaching profession after that experience. So what do we know um, about teachers with disabilities? Um, I want to share a couple of quick statistics to help put our knowledge into context. So first, um, according to recent data, 44.5 million people or 13.5% of the US population experience some form of disability, making it the largest minority group in the United States. Um, among K-12 students, a similar percentage, 14.7%, have been identified as having a disability. So if about 14% of the US population and student population experience disability, what percentage of teachers identify as having a disability? Honestly, it's very hard to say because no one collects data on this. Um, using the American Community Survey data from 2021, 7.4% um, 7, 7 of people who indicated that they work in an elementary or secondary school also indicated that they had a disability. Um, but of course, this is an imperfect measure. So it, it could be overestimating the number of teachers with disabilities because this count includes people in other school roles, not only teachers. Um, or it could under, underestimate the number of teachers with disabilities because the American Community Survey um, items that are used to determine whether or not a person is reporting a disability, um, those items don't capture people who identify as having a disability on other measures. So either way, um, the fact that we can't even begin to accurately estimate this population tells us that we have a lot to learn about this group of teachers. So that's a little bit about what we don't know. <laughs> it's important to note that um, there has been some research focused on teachers with disabilities, which was reviewed recently by NECA and colleagues in um, 2021. And among other findings, NECA and colleagues found that the literature base supported several conclusions about the contributions that disabled teachers make within their school communities. And I want to focus on three specific um, contributions and conclusions here. So specifically, many teachers with disabilities recalled challenging experiences in their own schooling, much like the experience that I mentioned earlier by the participant who's told she couldn't become a teacher. And the literature showed that experiences like this really motivated disabled teachers to provide their students with more effective learning experiences than they had experienced themselves. Um, additionally, studies showed that teachers with disabilities often developed innovative teaching practices. And these practices allowed them to work around any disability related challenges and had the added benefit that they served to meet the varying needs of their students and supported student skill development. And then finally, the literature showed that teachers with disabilities often um, reported being advocates for their students within their school communities. Um, and though this advocacy was often focused on students with disabilities, it could also extend to any students whom the teachers felt were being marginalized. So understanding these contributions, our research team decided to focus this study on identity, specifically because some researchers have posited that when teachers encounter those oppressive education systems, um, they can draw on their professional identity to fuel their resistance to those systems. So Carrie Rood, um, in the quote on this slide, stated things very eloquently eloquently saying, overall research on teacher identity and resistance has highlighted the impact that internalizing particular ideological beliefs has on teachers' beliefs and practices. Often teachers find ways to resist overarching systems that do not align with their belief systems in order to maintain a semblance of themselves and their identity. And so we were particularly interested in what this might look like for disabled teachers, especially because um, a component of disability identity, um, at least in this the model that we used, involves advocacy and giving back to the disability community. So we specifically looked at the disability identity development model developed by Forber Pratt and colleagues. And this model identifies four disability identity, sorry, four disability identity development statuses, um, which were understood to be fluid and changing. So although it's linear here, um, they recognized that this is not a linear de uh, development process. So these four statuses included acceptance, 
when the person and possibly their family came to accept the disability, um, relationships when the disabled individual meets and interacts with others who have similar disabilities or experiences, adoption when the individual begins to adopt perspectives of a disability um, community, and engagement when the individual strives to raise awareness and give back to the disability community. And so we were especially interested to learn if and how these perspectives might interact with an educator's professional identity and the implications for themselves and their students. So therefore, together with my colleagues, um, we designed a study aimed at developing an understanding of professional identity for teachers with disabilities. And our research questions focused on how disabled teachers describe the interaction of their life experiences and their identities as teachers, how participants describe their experiences as disabled teachers within education contexts, um, and how their stories reflected the development of participants' disability identity status in education contexts. We used a basic qualitative interpretivist design and collected data through interviews that lasted one to one and a half hours. We used Otter AI to transcribe recordings and double check the transcripts for accuracy. And this was a very small study. Um, it's a beginning, I hope, <laughs> to a larger research agenda um, with four participants. And I'll share a little bit more about those participants in a moment. In terms of data analysis, we use narrative analysis because understanding participants' stories can be especially, especially useful when we're investigating questions about identity. Um, and we started off by identifying the stories within each participant's interview. And then we used um, Labov's story elements as an initial coding approach. So on the right side of this slide, um, I've included a sample story showing the color coding we used for this approach. So we used yellow highlighting to um, highlight the story element of orientation, um, which was the setting or the characters of the story. So in this story example, I grew up in a family where everybody, nobody else had a disability. All right, sorry, just, just double checking the chat. Okay, blue represented the complicating action or the major events in the story. So for example, so for most of my life, there were people telling me, there's nothing wrong with you. You're fine, like you're so lucky. Green represented evaluation or the meaning of the story to the participant. In this example, it was just like this fix it mentality. This idea of like, there's nothing, there's nothing wrong with you. You're so lucky. Like you just sort of have to get it together and just sort of push through. And then pink represented the resolution or the story ending in this example. And that very much impacted the way that I think I saw myself in schools, as well as the student and the teacher. And there were a couple of other story elements that um, are not included in this example story, but these were the main ones that we used. So to promote trustworthiness, teams of two um, use these elements to analyze each transcript. And then we labeled each story with a title, which we typically took from phrases identified as orientation or complicating action, so the yellow and the blue. Um, and then we further um, assigned each story a code, which was typically an in vivo code from evaluations in green or res re resolutions in pink. Um, and then we analyzed each story to determine if or how it reflected the participant's disability identity status as described in Forber Pratt and colleagues' disability identity development model. So each story served as our unit of analysis. And then the structural narrative analysis with these different story elements served as the foundation for our thematic narrative analysis. Once our research team completed the analyses of the individual transcripts, the individual um, participants, we conducted a thematic analysis across participants by individually identifying common themes and then needing to compare observations and develop consensus. And then finally, we conducted member checks um, by sharing the identified themes and selected stories with participants. And two of the four participants responded to our member check email and indicated that the themes that we identified resonated with their experiences. To share a little bit more about our research team, we are a group of four current or former K-12 special educators, and two of our team members identify as disabled educators. We currently work in higher education, a state agency, and in a high school. Three of us identify as female, one as male, and all of us are white. 
we strove to be aware of these identities and experiences as we conducted this research. Um, and one way we did this was to conduct all of our data collection and analysis, either as a full team or at minimum in pairs. And specifically, we tried to partner um, researchers who identified as having a disability with those who did not so that we had that um, those different perspectives. We also wrote memos, met regularly, um, and engaged in reflective dialogue to ensure our findings were grounded in the data. And now most importantly, <laughs> the most interesting people involved in this study are our participants. So four women consented to participate in this study. All four are white educators who taught in the Northeast um, and who are pursuing or have completed master's or doctoral level education. Participant one, taught general and special education at the early childhood level for about 10 years, and at the time of the interview was not teaching while she pursued a doctoral program. She shared that she had both apparent and hidden disabilities. Participant two also taught for about 10 years at the middle and high school level, and she had recently developed a chronic health condition and felt she had to leave teaching as a result. Participant three was in her seventh year teaching middle school special education at the time of the interview, and she uses a wheelchair. And finally, participant four was completing a teacher preparation program in elementary special education at the time of the interview and has a hidden disability. So what did we learn from our interviews with those four teachers? As we, as I begin to share the findings, I wanted to remind you of our research questions um, and share how the emergent themes aligned with those questions. So just quickly, our first research question was focused on how participants describe the interaction of their life experiences with their identities as teachers. And three themes emerged in response to this question, specifically social and educational experiences shape teacher identity, teacher identity shapes and is shaped by disability identity and experiences, and disability provides a unique teaching perspective. Our second research question focused on how participants described their experiences as disabled educators within education contexts. And three themes also emerged in response to this question, strategic disclosure, the burden of accommodation, and emotional labor. And finally, two themes emerged in response to our research question regarding how participants' stories reflected the development of participants' disability identity status engagement as a disabled teacher, and all disability identity statuses contribute to teaching identities. So for the purpose of this talk, I'm going to focus specifically on just three of these themes. Um, disability provides a unique teaching perspective, the burden of accommodation, and all disability statuses contribute to teaching identities. So the first theme that I will discuss is disability um, providing a unique perspective. So this unique perspective could be seen at multiple levels, including when interacting with individual students, um, building classroom communities, or sharing perspectives with other teachers or school leaders. So one dimension of this unique perspective described by participants was their strong connections with their students. For example, participant four shared a story about working with a student who was experiencing a lot of anxiety about his health after returning to school after the pandemic school closures. And she described using a visual to help him independently determine if a situation was healthy or not. And then she explained, I was able to help him because I do have anxiety, not about the same things, but I knew that if I were in that moment, I would want a visual. And then I also told him, think of your anxiety as a superhero that's trying to protect you. It thinks, it thinks everything's a threat. It's trying to protect you from everything. So you've got to teach your superhero what's safe so that he can relax and take a step back and let you just live your life. So although her experiences were not exactly the same as her students, participant four drew from those experiences to provide her student with concrete strategies that allowed him to independ independently understand and man manage his anxiety. She saw her own experiences as a disabled educator as directly providing her with insights that could more effectively support her students' needs. Similarly, but at the classroom level, participant three described how her experiences supported the development of a strong classroom community, even though she has a physical disability while her students experienced emotional disabilities. She shared, I think that it, having a teacher with a disability, impacts my students positively. We have a really, really great community in my classroom because there are things that just take me longer to do. So we kind of developed this thing where it's like, who's gonna be my hands today? 
my kids are like, oh, me, me, me. They're just all excited because we all know when you help people, you feel valued. I think it helps on a couple different levels, like understanding and then like the representation piece and the community piece. So this story highlights how her approach to providing students with opportunities to help not only made her teaching more efficient, but it also demonstrated to her students their value and contribution to the classroom community. And in particular, Participant 3 saw her impact as a disabled educator spanning across multiple levels within her school community. For Participant 1, identifying as a teacher with a disability opened the door to conversations with students or teacher colleagues about what it means to have a disability within current society. Um, through her development of a disability identity, Participant 1 came to question assumptions about what schools consider to be normative behavior, and she drew on those perspectives in her interactions with her colleagues. In one story she shared, I had a student who really liked to wear headphones. Other teachers would be like, well, we really have to teach him like how to exist without the headphones. And I'm like, but do we? When I go on the metro or I go on the bus, like I see people with headphones in their ears all the time. In a world where we allow people to listen to music whenever they want to, and we see that as acceptable, why can't a student who just wants to muffle out some loud noises, like, why can't they do that? Throughout her interview, Participant One shared stories of how her identity as a disabled educator grew and changed, and these perspectives prompted her to challenge her colleagues to reconsider their assumptions and expectations. So a second theme that I'd like to highlight today is regarding the burden of accommodations. And three of our participants out of the four spoke about this theme. But I do want to mention that during our member checks, the fourth participant shared that while she hadn't discussed accommodations, um, she felt that it was an important theme. And she had just experienced so many barriers to requesting accommodations prior to her teaching experience that she'd never um, considered requesting them as a teacher. So for the three participants who did discuss this theme, they shared that requesting or receiving accommodations required that they take on burden. And um, some participants described a hesitation to requesting accommodations um, because of concerns of how their requests might be received. And others described interacting with a system that lacked processes to protect their rights and needs. Specifically, um, participant three, who has a physical disability, described her district as being very accommodating. Nevertheless, she chose not to request accommodations until she was granted tenure after her first two years of teaching, and she continued to feel hesitant to make her first request. She shared, the first time I needed to ask for an accommodation was like, we were getting new computers. So I like contacted HR and the guy came to meet with me and I was like, I'm sorry, I really don't want to make this a whole big thing. And they were just super calm and like normal about it. And that's really the only accommodation I asked for to start. And then my disability is progressive. So two or so years ago, I asked for an extra 15 minutes for lunch. Of course, I don't ever take it, but it's there. So I think they're pretty accommodating. It's just kind of like, if I need something, I say something. And if I don't, it's good, you know? Participant three was very active. Um, was a very active advocate and member of the disability community, and she had engaged in state-level policy advocacy. But in this story, she shared her nervousness about requesting accommodations, and she downplayed her use of the accommodations, which illustrates the complexity of using accommodations in school settings, where teachers are often expected to make do with less and go above and beyond for their students. So like the previous participant, um, staff within the school where participant two worked appeared to be accommodating, but in participant two's case, the offered accommodations were unhelpful, while accommodations that would have actually been helpful were dismissed. She shared the story. So around the end of May, we did a fire drill, and one of the women who worked in the office like came rushing towards me with a wheelchair. And she thought she was being nice, but I had to explain to her in the moment, that's not what I need. So there were instances of them trying to like guess what I needed, but it wasn't really right. But then on the other hand, they would schedule me for like four straight hours of teaching with no breaks. And I'd be like, I need to go to the bathroom like every half hour with this condition. And then they would be like, oh, well, just text me when you need to go. And that puts it all on me. Like I'm also teaching. I can't just be whipping out my phone and, phone and texting you. So in this case, school administr administrators seemed to think that they were accommodating this participant by offering to cover her classes when needed. But instead of putting a structured plan in place, such as altering her teaching schedule, 
administrators place the responsibility back on the shoulders of the, the teacher, adding to her stress of teaching with this condition as she worried about both um, having appropriate coverage when she needed it, as well as the instructional impact. And the final theme that I want to discuss today is that participants shared stories that seemed to reflect experiences across all four disability identity statuses um, high, um, identified by Forber Pratt and colleagues. And these stories reflected participants' specific contexts and highlighted how their identities were shaped in response to individual situations and the actions of the people around them. So the first um, disability identity status described by Forber Pratt and colleagues was acceptance. And keep in mind that this is not a linear process, um, but I will, I will be going through them in this order. So in this, um, in this status, individuals come to accept their disability. And participant two shared the importance of acceptance in her own identity journey and her frustration with others who seem to be urging her not to accept her circumstances. She said, people will constantly tell you like, oh, don't give up hope. And it's like, actually, no. My insides are just not functional in that way. It's actually like smart for me to give up hope because it's it's delusional sometimes. I feel like that's another liberating part. When you accept, you can start the very human process of just adapting to what your new thing is. So although she didn't directly link acceptance with her professional teaching identity in her interview, participant two shared how this tension between her own attempts at acceptance and her colleagues and family's um, lack of understanding added to the emotional distress and exhaustion she experienced, in addition to the physical pain and everyday teaching challenges she experienced. So while acceptance was liberating for her personally, in some ways it complicated her interactions with others. The second disability identity status described by Forber Pratt and colleagues was relationships, when individuals began to develop relationships with others who have similar disability related experiences. And for participant four, this occurred in college. She explained, my freshman advisor who had ADHD, he was like, hey, I have ADHD and a learning disorder, and these are my issues. I struggle with turning things in. I struggle with getting work done. And he was very accepting of me and was always there to be like, you've got it, you're good. Because of that, I've always been willing, been very willing to share. Yeah, it was honestly my very my first really good relationship with a teacher. Um, her story touches on the impact that educators with disabilities might have on their students, um, especially those with disabilities. And unfortunately, participant four had to wait until college for that first good relationship with a teacher with a disability. The third disability identity status described by Forber Pratt and colleagues was adoption, during which individuals begin to adopt some of the values of the disability community. And participant one described this process as occurring through her master's program and her teaching experiences, saying, I just started to think more critically about the decisions that I was making and maybe why I approach things in a different way than other teachers did. And it just became like undeniable to me that even if it's disability is not something that I'm not out, even if disability is not something that I'm outwardly identifying with, it's shaping the decisions that I think. So even before participant one began to publicly identify as a teacher with a disability, she began to recognize how her experiences as a disabled person were inseparable from her perspectives and decision-making as a teacher. And then the fourth um, disability identity status described by Forber Pratt and colleagues was engagement, during which people engage in advocacy to raise awareness and give back to the disability community. And all four participants described engagement, but here I'll focus on a story shared by participant three when she emailed the school staff about making sure the elevator was clear of carts and other equipment so that it was readily available for her to use. And she said, I had sent out a whole staff email the day before about something completely different, some kind of initiative we're doing or whatever. So I prefaced it, her email about the elevator, by like, hi everyone, sorry for the second or third email this week. I was like, no, don't worry, I'm not gonna be sending emails like every day. But yeah, what other people think about me isn't my problem because number one, I don't know what they're thinking unless they tell me. So I can't sit here and pretend I know what they're thinking. And if they don't like it, that's okay. Like, I don't care, not made for everyone. So participant three didn't hesitate to advocate for herself and raise awareness about accessibility. At the same time, she recognized that some people might push back against her advocacy, but remained firm in her conviction that she was doing the right thing. 
All right, so that was a very quick dive into three of the eight themes we identified, and I want to just highlight a couple of implications and then turn the discussion over to Dr. Rice. Um, so first, I want to acknowledge that there are a lot of limitations to this very, very small preliminary study. Um, the biggest limitation being the lack of diversity among participants, as well as the lack of racial diversity on our research team. So we weren't intentionally recruiting white female teachers for this study, but those were the people who expressed interest and consented, um, which means that we really need to be looking critically at our recruitment strategies um, and also thinking about why it is that teachers of color or other who have other diverse backgrounds um, might be less inclined to participate. In this study, some participants talked about intersectionality in terms of being a woman with a disability, um, especially in a role as a teacher that has historically been viewed as a female role. And additionally, almost all of our participants also explicitly talked about the privilege that they experienced because of their race or socioeconomic status or both. Um, and they recognized that their experience would be very different from that of a teacher of color with a disability or if they'd grown up in a family with less access to economic resources. So as I move forward in this research pathway, um, I'm thinking about how we can find approaches to better understand those experiences of teachers with disabilities with more diverse backgrounds. Um, and finally, in terms of implications, um, there is one implication is that there is a pressing need for additional research that investigates the potential impact of teachers with disabilities on their students. So given that teachers with disabilities in this study and other studies, as I mentioned at the beginning of this talk, um, described using innovative instructional approaches and they profess a deep empathy for their students, it seems possible that this group of teachers might be uniquely equipped to connect with and meet the diverse needs of their students, but we have yet to actually investigate this possibility. Um, second, I think that there's a need for us to rethink um, workplace the workplace accommodation process and rethink it, of it as a partnership rather than the sole responsibility of the person requesting accommodations. Um, of course, in order for this to happen, there's a need for school leaders to better understand the legal rights of teachers with disabilities and how to effectively provide accommodations in their schools. Um, teachers with disabilities are often um, already experiencing a disproportionate challenge as they operate within these school systems that were built for those without disabilities. Um, and the current approach to um, supposedly accommodating teachers might only actually be adding to their burden. And then finally, I would argue that there's a need for us to fundamentally rethink our approach and consider what schools might look like if we design them to be supportive of all teachers from the very beginning. So the approach of universal design for learning is often used in classrooms to design instruction in ways that uh, is accessible to all learners. And I would argue that we need to extend the principles of universal design across the entire school community. Um, we definitely need additional research to understand what universal design might look like at a school and systems level and how that might support all teachers um, who are doing that important work of preparing the next generation of students to contribute thoughtfully to society. All right. Um, and thank you very much for your time. I want to now turn things over to my wonderful colleague, um, Dr. Rice. Thank you, Dr. Kushner, for what was a invigorating investigation and an engagement with stories that we don't often uh, get to hear. Uh, from one Elizabeth to another, uh, this year's response will be given by Dr. Elizabeth Rice. Uh, Dr. Rice is an Associate Professor of Special Education and Disability Studies uh, here at the Graduate School of Education and Human Development. Dr. Rice has been a member of the GW faculty since 2001, a former classroom teacher of students with a variety of learning and emotional challenges. She has served as a principal investigator on local and uh, federal personnel training grants and coordinates a master's degree program for special education teachers, as well as the doctoral program in special education. Her current research interests and publications focus on girls with emotional behavioral challenges, school slash university partnerships, and effective interventions for students with social, emotional, and behavioral difficulties. Thank you, Dr. Rice. We are honored to hear your response. Thank you. 
And thank you so much for the opportunity to respond to the wonderful work of my colleague, Elizabeth Kutcher. My name is Elizabeth, my nickname's Lisa Rice, and I'm a middle-aged white woman with blonde hair and glasses, and I use the pronouns she and her. So congratulations, Dr. Kutcher. Your talk was informative, timely, and intellectually stimulating. Uh, special thanks to, uh, doc, to you, Dr. Wright, as well, for helping us celebrate uh, GW's Martin Luther King Week here and for developing this uh, lecture series. So Dr. Kutcher, as I think about your work, I feel very hopeful for the future. Your work showcases many of the ideas that are shaking up the field of education and disability rights today. And I'd like to highlight some of those ideas that you adeptly wove into your research paradigm and practice. First, um, your work reminds us that all means all. You situate your work in the disability rights movement uh, rather in that deficit model of intervention. And we all deserve to have our strengths recognized and we need to better understand the experiences and thoughts of all teachers. So thank you for that. I also appreciate your uh, reference to Judy Human, uh, who is a longtime friend of my mentors here at DW. And I'll never forget my experiences of hearing her speak about her desire to become a teacher. So she was telling us in class about applying for a teaching position the one that she actually ended up suing about. Um, and here in the School of Ed, we might think that maybe her interviewer asked about curriculum or classroom management, but no. The interviewer uh, just asked how she was going to use the bathroom. She was denied the opportunity to become a teacher because she was seen as less than. She did not do things in the same way the system had dictated and was therefore labeled and dismissed. And with this ableism in education, the ableism that, as you showed, continues today, it is no wonder that so many teachers with disabilities have not been highlighted in research. So I appreciate your efforts to change that. In your talk, you also talk about the importance of the civil rights movement and the fight for equality by African Americans has really supported and led the way for disability rights. Um, the civil rights movement helped, you know, the disability community go from what Wolfensberger would call objects of pity or objects of charity to, to fellow citizens. And I love uh, that Dr. King once said, it's not possible to be in favor of justice for some people and not to be in favor of justice for all people. When separate became inherently unequal, the disability community was able to force others to see them as people, under, at least under the law. People who should not be thrust into attics, freak shows, eugenics experiments, the basement of schools, or telethons. Through pro protests that you mentioned, such as the Capitol Crawl and the Section 504 sit-ins, the disability rights movement made strides towards equality, at least in law. But like the civil rights movement, progress was made, but we still have a long way to go. In your presentation, you spent some time orienting the audience to the number of people who identify as disabled people or people with disabilities in the world. People with disabilities have a variety of identities, which you so eloquently discussed. We all have those different identities. The intersectionalities of our identities makes us unique. And we are now in the time of a neurodiversity movement. And I, I'm very excited about that renaming and reconceptualization of ability. I appreciate that you did not choose to use the medical model of disability. You did not talk about what was wrong or list characteristics of how someone is not able. You used the social model of disability. The medical model um, notes what people cannot do. It pathologizes difference. While the social model of disability stresses that it's the society that has created the concept of ability and disability. Um, the medical model of disability seeks the identification of problems and seeks to cure differences. So it always 
resonates with me when I think of for a person who uses a wheelchair, and you actually mentioned this as well, the medical model faults him, her, or them for not being able to climb the steps. And this leads to feelings of isolation, exclusion. However, in the social model of disability, it's not the person who uses the wheelchair who's at fault. Rather, it's a societal flaw that the staircase was not the only way to make access to a building. So our society is created and maintained for a very narrow view of humanity. I hope that your work leads others to begin to think about leaving this medical model of disability. Why are schools created the way they are? For your participants, why do they have to be feel like they are devalued because of a certain system set up a certain way? For me in higher education, I ask, you know, why are there time tests? Why is reading the only way to glean class information? Why do we have classrooms that are not accessible? We are stuck in an antiquated paradigm that robs many of us of potential. Oh, and by the way, our outcomes could be really get better. So it's not like there's any uh, reason to not reimagine education as you suggested and to universally design it. Lastly, I wanna commend your methodology. You highlight the voices of people with disabilities through your research design. You interviewed individuals and shared their words seeking meaning and insight. And I look forward to hearing more about the expansion of your work and interviews as you take it into this future directions. It's also notable that your research team included researchers with disabilities. Future research must involve people with disabilities, both in the conceptualization as you did and the implementation of research. Arnstein in, in 1969 shared a ladder of citizen participation that can be applied to our work. Um, and I, I see that your work reminded me of, the, of that ladder. That bottom level of the participatory ladder is manipulation and therapy. And that's where we research about people without their input. And then as you go up the ladder of participation, you can find some tokenism but continuing up, we reach partnership, a true sharing of power. And I believe we must embody this value of diversity in our attitudes and actions. And you did that in your study. I love it because I've learned from many disability activists um, when they say nothing about us without us. Your work, uh, Dr. Kutcher, is rooted in disability rights and respect. And we should continue your work highlighting the voices of teachers with disabilities in, in the way that you modeled for us. So thanks again for your presentation and for your work in this field. And just to wrap up uh, with, with Dr. King's quote again, we have come a long, long way, but we have a long, long way to go. Uh, and I'm excited and hopeful for the future and really um, applaud you for this wonderful presentation. All right, thank you, Dr. Rice, for that wonderful response and for using and integrating the legacy of Dr. King into the disability rights movement. Uh, before we go to the Q&A, Dr. Kutcher, do you have any quick responses or questions for Dr. Rice? I do not. Thank you, Dr. Rice, for your comments. <laughs> 